Mr. Scott Hambrick, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. No, yeah, this is great. This is great. So you and I just got uh, finished training in your spectacular garage gym. Yes. It is spectacular. Like you've got two racks. Thank you. Stained platforms. It's a classy, it's a classy joint. We try. We try. try. So uh, we're not going to talk about training the body though. <laughs> right. Today. We're going we're gonna to talk about training the mind because you started a little thing, onlinegreatbooks.com. Let's talk about the great books for those who aren't familiar with it. What are the great books and who decided? Who, is the, who are the people who got to decide? Like these books <laughs> right. are great. Those books are not great. Yeah, that's, that's sort of the... The sort of the postmodern debate now, like what you know, what constitutes the great books? Here's my opinion: the great books, I believe, the the list that comprises the great books is a, like I believe is a, an emergent canon, right? So if you pick up one of these books, I don't know, you go pick up Nietzsche, let's say, and you're going to read that for a little bit, and he's going to mention Descartes, and you're like, gosh, he's that guy. Then you go pick up that book, and then he mentions Aristotle. Oh gosh, now I got to go read him, and he. The way these books are self-referential and they're like, a, you know, Mortimer Adler called them a great conversation between all these geniuses. And so the list is self-evident because they refer to each other and answer each other's questions in term over time. And different, different organizations have different lists, but they're 90%, 95% identical because this, is, this list is emergent. These books ref, refer to each other and you really have to read them all to get what all of them are saying to each other. Gotcha. So great. We're talking classics. We're going, yeah, you mentioned Nietzsche. Descartes, you're going all the way back to Plato. Hey, you drill down and then you end up, you end up at the Iliad every, you, every time. Yeah, no pretty much every turn. time. Yeah, you end up at the Iliad. So you mentioned Mortimer Adler because this guy was, he was a big part of this. There was like a movement, I would say, in the middle of this, the 20th century where intellectual scholars decided, let's systemize the, the, the great books for a lay audience. And, and Mortimer Adler, let's talk, talk about this guy because he's kind of, he's an interesting Interesting cat. Super interesting guy. Yeah, the, the, in, ni- in the 1920s, there was a guy, John Erskine at Columbia, who, who started doing this kind of great books thing where he, it was kind of a return to basics idea, you know, and trying to uh, kind of reaction to modern academia, I guess. And, and one of his students was Mortimer Adler. And Adler was, you know, smitten by these great books and the changes he saw in himself. And he ended up, he ended up not graduating from Columbia because he had to take a physical, a physical ed requirement. <laughs> and, and he, he refused to take swimming for physical ed and they ne- they didn't give him a degree. And like the, he got one in the eighties from there as an honorary. So he walked away and he went to university of Chicago and ended up founding with Robert Hutchins, the basic program at university of Chicago, which is based in these great books. And so Adler believed that these books were for everyone and that reading and studying these books was a great democratic project. Not like a political project, but a, a project for everybody, for the demos. To be a good citizen, you needed to know the things in these books, to be acclimated to society, to know how to think, to know what's at stake. And it was his life work to get get more people to read these. And he eventually cut a deal with the Encyclopedia Britannica Company and edited a 54-volume set of what he thought to be the great books of the Western world, and they were sold door-to-door to houses all over America. You know, he was like the Gideons of the, right, right. <laughs> of the great books. And, you know, a lot of people, their grandparents may have had a set of those uh, on, in the bookshelf by the fireplace, you know. Yeah, they're, they're the great books for, like, you put them, in, like, for decoration. Right, right. right. Yeah, they're mostly for decoration. The print's too small. You can't write in the margins. It's, it's, no, yeah. If, if you see the ones like the encyclopedia kinds, they're terrible to read. Like, yeah. They're not reader friendly. And I've got four sets of them because I love them, but they're right. terrible. <laughs> they're terrible to read. And and he had a lot of trouble getting permission to use, you know, the best translations, you know, or copyright issues and stuff. So he ended up using some out of copy out of copyright protection editions that are kind of hard to read. But if you if you find good translations of these books and you read them in a group and uh, take it take it on systematically, it's it's much easier than people think, right? Because the, the books are excellent, and uh, you know, and it's it's a transformative project, I think. And Adler did too, right? So this was like in the 1950s when this encyclopedia yeah. thing happened, and and since then, I mean, have they added? to the the list at all since then or is it kind of stayed pretty much the same yeah i think the first edition came out in 52 it was 54 volumes and then the, they, the second edition came out in like 92 i think or something like that and it's now 60 volumes and so they added wittgenstein Karl popper virginia wolf there's there, there quite a bit added from the 20th century and okay so it wasn't just 
I mean, they created the collection of books. Did Adler also, and he meant, this was meant for the lay audience. This was mm-hmm. not meant for people who had advanced degrees. Like he wanted business people in their spare time, housewives. Everyone. Everyone to read this stuff. So did he establish like a system, like how you're supposed to go through these books? Or was it like you just start chronologically from the Iliad and you work your way through? Or was there like you do, you know, you're going to do philosophy for a little bit and you're going to do history and then you're going to do English literature. Like what was, what was the system? Well, Adler's system in the introduction volume to the great books of the Western world, there was a reading list. It's a 10 year reading list and it's, it's organized what he called syntopically. So you'll read about a specific issue and what people have had to say and write about that over this millennia. So you might read about justice, for example, you see, you'll read some excerpts from, you'll read some, read some excerpts from the Odyssey maybe. And you might read the first book of the Republic. And then you end up reading some John Locke and you see the whole scope of thought around that one topic. So that's a good way to approach it because you, you move from to author to author. You don't get bogged down in somebody's, you know, crusty style that you don't like, you know, and it helps you kind of move through it. At onlinegreatbooks.com, we go through them in chronological order because we believe that they scaffold on each other. And you know, t- to best understand the Republic, we think that you need to have read the Odyssey, um, the right. Iliad, a great number of the, the tragedies, and have worked your way up to that. Because that's what Plato did, right? He was familiar with Odyssey and the Iliad and those tragedies, and that was the milieu that he came out of. And, he's, and he refers to that stuff all the time. And if you've read those things, when you come to the Republic— you know, you get all the inside jokes. Like right. you're, you're in on it. Right. You know? Yeah. A lot more insights, a lot more productive reading yeah. um, when you do it that way. Um, but you know, the, the, the challenge though, and I, I think it's a good point thing to point out, like this is a, a long-term project. A lot of people, like when they first hear about the great books, they're like, oh yeah, I'm going to put that on my bucket list. I'm going to start doing that. <laughs> right. And I'm going to get this done in a year, two years. Like that is impossible. Like you, yeah. you're in this for the long, the long haul. Yeah, it, it's like the weight training we do. It's a it's a it's a lifestyle choice that you make that it's transformative and and is worth it. But it, it you can't just you can't just go squat a little bit and then be a strong squatter, right? It's something you commit to and you have to do on a regular basis and commit yourself to it. And you know, I don't want to scare anybody off of this project. If you've got a year you can devote to it before you have to you know take on this new job or have kids or whatever, then by you know, by all means, give it a year. Right. Um, but you know, we're in it for the long haul, and we. And we love it. It's it's not a sacrifice at this point, you know. I, I mean, you said it's transformative. How how do you? I mean, what was Adler's goal? You said his goal was to make, you know, he wants people to read these great books to create better citizens. I mean, beyond that, I mean, what's the personal reward from reading this stuff? Because a lot of people think, well, you know, how do, what do I get out of reading stuff written by dead guys, <laughs> right? Yeah, from ancient Greece. Well, for me, I've obtained a liberal education. You know, I have a background in chemistry and microbiology. It's a very specific, very pointed, you know, education that I got. And I had big holes in my education. You know, I didn't have much humanities work. I wasn't, wasn't familiar with you know, schools of psychological thought or philosophical thought. And, and you know, I get, get to my mid-30s and start to realize kind of how lopsided I am, you know, kind of got the mind of an engineer maybe. And, you know, taking on these things, learning how to read fiction. I mean, a lot of guys struggle with reading fiction, you know, uh, learning how to read fiction, eavesdropping on this great conversation about these big issues has made me a more well-rounded person. And uh, it helps break reading these books. Like for, We'll talk about the Republic again. The, the Republic starts by asking, what is justice? Right. And then they wrestle that out. And, uh, in reading these geniuses talk about what justice may or may not be, it starts to break, it has broken the script in my head of what I thought justice might be, right? Because we, we hit 21 years old and you've got a toolbox of ideas in your head that your parents gave you and pop culture gave pop culture. You. you. It's right. just it's just there, it's baked in. And by using by using this material as a, you know, as a as food for thought, we can kind of we can break that script we're handed, you know, and and refine our tools and refine the way we think about things. And Adler believed, and we believe that you don't just read them. You also have to discuss these books as well, because that's where the comprehension of the, of the material goes way, way up. And where the transformation, that's where you take action on what you've read is in the discussion. And so in having those discussions, I have, uh, I've been able to know why I believe something, right? Because right, right. when you're 21, you're like, I believe this. And if somebody holds your feet to the fire and says, why? 
a lot of times we end up saying, well, cause. Because, yeah. <laughs> because. No. And so uh, knowing why I believe something gives me permission, it gives me room to actually change my mind. Right. Which is interesting. Knowing firmly why you believe something will actually let you, you know, change one of your presuppositions, change one of your axioms later, and then move off of that. Putting a stake in the ground lets you actually be able to change position more easily. Yeah. No, I, I found in my, in my experience, like, you know, with writing content for the site, like, I don't really understand a concept until I write about right. it. Right. Until I'm forced to, like, explain things and the discussion. I mean, I think it's the same thing with discussing. Like, yep. you, you really, it, uh, it's like that whole iron sharpens iron thing we are trying to use a trivium model in addition to the great books so yeah what a trivium what is that yeah so the trivium is the three basic liberal arts grammar logic and rhetoric and, and grammar loosely is sort of the bones of a subject right it's the it's the jargon that you use it's the vocabulary specific to that subject logic is how all of those bones of the subject are organized and then the rhetoric part is you know teaching writing persuading you know, using using your words like our mom right. told us to, to to get to get the ideas out of our consciousness into the consciousness of another, and in in the in our online greatbooks.com project, the seminar is the main the main tool we used to to execute this rhetoric. We also do some writing; it's not required, but we have opportunities for people to write and present papers and defend those papers, and they can they can take that really as far as they want to. In fact, we have a group inside our our program who are studying Greek and Latin. Oh, wow. That's it's, impressive. It's, so we've used, we, we've just, I've just extended our platform for those guys to, you know, use, use our accountability tools, use our online classrooms and stuff to meet and, and, and work on Greek and Latin. So uh, we've got some guys, I say guys, it's men and women, but I've, we've got some members that are really taking the trivium piece of this very seriously. That's amazing. Yeah. I like, this, I think I want to read it, read, like I hit on this point of the trivium because I think it's a, it's a really useful way to think about education because, you and I probably, when we got our education, we didn't like, you know, I remember in history, you had to have teachers say like, facts don't matter. Like the dates don't matter, right? Well, in a trivia model, they say, no, that that does matter. That's yes. the grammar part, right? right? You know, because I remember like my teachers be like, you just got to be able to make an argument, right? But in order to make that argument, you need to know the facts. You need to be able to, and I think we've had, um, what's her name? Susan Wise, University of Virginia. She talks a lot about homeschooling and self-education and she hits this point home it's like it's super important for you to learn basic facts because you can't you can't be expected to make a good argument you know the rhetoric part you can't skip you can't skip the grammar and go right to rhetoric like you have to go there yet yeah, knowing the facts is how you organize yourself in the thought space it's how you negotiate in your mind you know where where you are I'm making air quotes, uh, in, in an argument. And you, you have to know the basic facts of the matter at hand or, you, or your argument is, I mean, it could be anything. It at could that be point. anything, it could right, be, right. And so, it often is, right? Right, yeah. We're, we're all about opinions, right? And I think one of the things I found with the great books that it does for me is it, I've kind of realized like, and just reading it stuff, you know, it's been a, part of, been a part of my background. Like I studied classics at college and I've done it off, on and off reading the stuff. And one of the things I found is like, man, these guys have been grappling with these questions. Like, what is justice? What is courage? For a thousand, they're, they're still not getting it right, right? And so it's like, for me, it's like, boy, these guys have had a hard time. They're really smart. Like, maybe I should have fewer opinions right. <laughs> about it. Like, and not be so certain. It doesn't mean you, you, don't, you, don't, have, you don't have any certainties. But it, 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 as you said, it, 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 once you realize that how hard it is to pin this stuff down, you, there's a humility that comes with that. Yeah, Socrates said that the only thing that he knew was that he didn't know anything. Right. And that's why he's probably the best teacher that ever lived, or at least our conception of him, you know, is a symbol for what the best teacher that ever lived could be. Right. And he, he, uh, he called himself a midwife. He called yeah, himself a right. gadfly. Yeah. So he would just, he would be in the agora, the marketplace, and some poor guy would just be trying to buy some pottery or something, and he would just accost them. You know, he's like, "What's virtue?" And the guy's like, "I'm trying to buy pots." No, you know? yeah, some, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I have like a love hate relationship with Socrates, or at oh, least how Plato portrayed him, because he he just sounds like, he sounds like an internet troll. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, sometimes, right? He can come off as kind of trollish. Oh well, I think he was, but you know, he's in Athens. You know, I'm just some redneck from Catoosa, Oklahoma. So, you know, there are going to be errors of fact I'm going to make here. But he's in Athens. It's a small town, actually. You know, I don't know, 40,000 yeah, people there. there. And not many of the people have the franchise. Not many people can vote, right? right. So he, 
he probably knows most of the people who can vote. Actually, they own property, they're men, they've been had military service. Like there's not a lot of people that can vote. And he knows a great number of those people. So when we read one of these these dialogues and he just accosts some poor guy at the well, you know, trying to get some water. He probably knows that guy and he probably knows how he voted the last time, <laughs> you know, but that's the backstory we're not getting. And he's like, Hey, you know, and he just, you know, can you actually teach virtue? You know, we call it, what is virtue? What is virtue? You uh, call yourself a teacher of virtue. Tell me what is virtue? Yeah. What is virtue? Uh, yeah. Actually, that's how it starts. Mino, he asked, uh, Mino asked Socrates, you know, uh, the Mino, which is one of my favorite of the dialogues. He says, Mino says to Socrates, hey, can virtue be taught? And Socrates goes, oh, no, no, time out. <laughs> What's virtue first? Right. And they argue about that, and they really never figured out. And, uh, and then they talk about whether it can be taught. And, and so they talk about virtue, and then they talk about whether it can be taught or not. And the consequences of this short little story are enormous. Can you teach something or not? It has consequences for child rearing, criminal justice, public education, Everything. There's Epist- all, there's, epistemology, yeah, right? Epistemo- like, right. Yeah. Where does what knowledge is, come from? Where does knowledge come from? Right. What is yeah. knowledge? Yeah, right? What can be known? How do we know it? Yeah. It's all in this little, you know, 39 page dialogue. And yeah, you'd have a super rich conversation about a lot of the things that matter. And so to add, you know, back to Adler, you know, he loved the idea of people who have the franchise, people that can vote. We're essentially, because I can vote. I'm responsible for you to some degree, right. or at least responsible to you for some degree. Right. And, and Adler wanted people that were voting to have had civil, deep conversations about the things that matter. And using these great books is one way to do that. And, you know, I get, I mean, you talk about utopia a lot. <laughs> I guess I'm a utopian. I think if everybody did this and met in each other's living rooms every other week or once a month and argued about justice, when the stakes are low, right? We're reading right. the Mino, we're reading the right. Republic, and the stakes are low. I think discourse in the public would be more civil. I think voting would be more reliable. I think we'd have a better outcome. Right. Well, let's, let's go back to this. Let's hit on the symposium part. So that was a big part of it. Like Adler didn't just want people to read these. I mean, you could, you can read these individually. You bet. And, and get something out of it. But Adler envisioned, and some of these other proponents of the great books, they wanted people having conversations. They basically wanted people to have like a a college class, you know, philosophy class experience in their homes with, right. with their neighbors and yeah. friends. And, and they, uh, Adler advocated for what he called a shared inquiry model. So there's nobody in charge. Like okay, there's, so there's no teacher. Like there's, there's no, no teacher. Right, okay. Right, in fact, and we, and we adhere to that too. You know, I tell the guys that host our seminars, you know, if you get caught te- teaching, you're fired. Because these the, the, the reading of, and discussion of these books should be a very personal experience. And it, because... We'll go back to that. So it's a shared inquiry model. So we do have, even if you do a home great books group, you're going to have somebody that's nominally in charge. They start the meeting and finish the meeting and kind of keep it on track. But they're the first among equals. And they're asking questions about the book just like everybody else is. And in asking those questions, you bring the consciousness of the entire group to bear on the idea in the book. And talking to those other consciousnesses about these ideas is very instructive, helps us round out the trivium, and it helps us actually interact in a physical way and mental way with the text. And that's, I mean, and and those two things are necessary, I think, for the book to actually transform your brain, transform you, make you into the new person. No, I totally agree. I mean, so let's let's talk about how this whole, your your, your thing started, the online, because like I'm I'm part of a, a book group Nominally, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not as active as I wish I, I would. He, he, you drop in. Sometimes. I drop in sometimes. <laughs> but like, I remember when you first were getting this thing going a couple of years ago. So, like, what what prompted you to say, "I want to read these great books," but like, I want, I don't want to do this by myself. Like, how did that? How did that whole thing happen? And how did that your personal experience turn into? I'm going to offer a service to other people so they can do they can experience this as well. Well, it's a crusade. <laughs> <laughs> You're on a mission. You are a ut- utopian. Yes, I am. No, I. Well, we were sending my kids to the little snotty prep school, private school here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I was unsatisfied with the education they were getting. And we, my wife and I, decided to home educate the kids. And in doing that, I realized that 
my education wasn't as full as it could be. And I started figuring out, you know, how, how could I, how can I make up these deficits, you know, as a busy, you know, guy in his late thirties, you know, how would I do that? And I found the great books program and, and started working on that a little bit. And then I realized that I did lack that seminar, that, that group experience, that discussion. And a friend of mine, Jim Furr and I decided, well, we're going to start a group. And so I wrote, I have a dining room table that with eight chairs and I, Jim was coming to the meetings, and so I wrote six letters to six men that I knew and invited them to come to the group. All of them came but you. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, I was really, I'll be honest, so I was super stoked. I was like, like this is amazing. Yeah. Me, this is great that someone's doing this. I just, I didn't have the, I didn't have the, I didn't want to commit, and I, I didn't have the bandwidth. So. But I knew that, I knew that you'd actually taken up that project on your own. And, and then I wrote one more letter, because so, you bounced me. And then that guy came, and then the group group grew, and we've been meeting on the third Thursday at my house now for almost four years. We've read twelve thousand pages. Yeah, where, where are we at? We're doing Aquinas right now, yeah, right? St. Thomas Aquinas, Saint Thomas reading Aquinas. on a bunch of metaphysical stuff this month. And but it. imagine that that's four years, and you, you guys started at the Iliad. Yeah. And we're like, what? What century are we in now? Like, I don't even know what is it. Eleven hundred. Eleven hundred. So yeah. we're not. I mean, it's it's that's a long. It takes a long time to get it through does. this stuff. The the really hard one. We Augustine. <laughs> Augustine yeah. was tough. Yeah, we read all of the City of God. The City of God. And it's you know it's eleven hundred pages, and he's just everybody's grumpy grandpa. He's crusty. <laughs> right. And, right. Right. Uh, he's kind of funny though. He but, is funny. He's kind of snarky about uh, the Romans. And yeah. Yeah. Their barbaric beliefs. Yeah, so, that, well, that's how it started. And I loved the group. I loved what it's done. The guys that come to the group won't miss it. I mean, it's a big part of their life now. And you and I were talking out in the garage gym one day, and you're like, you really ought to do that online. And uh, so we did. So January 8th, we we kicked the door open at onlinegreatbooks.com. And, you know, I've got those guys, the, the people that we, we've been open now for know, six months or whatever it is. And they've read like almost a half a million pages collectively. You know, I, yeah. I've had, I've had several people email me thanking me. I want to get choked up, get choked up. Mm. They said that they'd never read a book before and they read the Iliad and they could have done it without it. And, uh, yeah. you know, we've got auto mechanics, you know, HVAC guys, nurses, you know, stay at home moms. I mean, all kinds of people doing this right. and, uh, you know, people have never read a book before. Yeah. Can you imagine the first book that you've ever finished is the Iliad? Iliad, no. Like my, <laughs> the first, first book I ever finished was like the boxcar children, <laughs> which is good though. I love that. <laughs> I love those. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, you're, you're kind of fulfilling Adler's dream here. Like he wanted every, the every man, this was mm-hmm. supposed to be an education for every free democratic Western citizen. Like they need to know this stuff. And I, I think, you know, one of the reasons I said, you know, I encourage you to get this online because we've talked about this before on the Barbell Logic podcast is that there's a lot of people, they, they want that. They want, they want a, a group of people they can meet with and discuss ideas with, mm-hmm. but they don't have any friends. I think you've had that issue. Like, I think you mentioned it one time on your Instagram feed and you, people are like, I want to do this, but like, I only know like one guy. Yeah. A lot of people don't know how to host. They don't know how to host. Either. They don't know how to host. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, onlinegreatbooks.com. It's super awesome. Go sign up. <laughs> right. But it's way better to do it at home. Like if you can get five, six, eight people to come to your home on a regular basis, eat some good cheese, and, you know, and, and talk about these books. It's a better experience, but it's really hard. You know, people in metropolitan areas often don't have the space to do that. A lot of people don't know five, six, eight people that'll read stuff like right, this. That's the thing. Like, you, might, you might know, you know, 10 people in your circle, uh, in your social circle, but how many of them want to, you know, read the Iliad yep. and discuss it or read St. Augustine <laughs> right? And, and discuss it? There's probably not many people. So like what I think the value that you provide is, you you're able to get people who want to do this and give them that symposium. So like how are you sign up and it is, it is a paid service, yep. right? And, and I know you encourage like you, it's you like sign up, right? It's fantastic. But if you want to do, do it own, at home, do it at home. You, there's a there's lists are out there. They're free. Do it on your own. Yeah. Let me but say it, a little bit about the list. Right. You, if you just Google great books of the Western world list, you're going to find that you can go find the St. John's college reading list. You can find the university of Chicago basic program reading list. The lists are out there. Yeah. There's tons of lists. Yeah. Um, you and they're all good. Own. Yeah. But if you want that symposium part and you're having a hard time finding yep. people in your. Now, in wait your, a minute. The symposium, that's the drinking. Okay. Party. That's the drinking. <laughs> well, there, there is drinking. There is drinking at ours. At yours. I don't imbibe, but yeah, I, 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 I get the benefit of that because everyone gets loosened up and in right. vino veritas. Right. right. But so the, the, the seminar aspect, if you want that and you're, you can't get it where you're at, 
online grade books can do that for you. That's right. And and as you said, like there's no teacher. There's just a facilitator. There, there's midwives of thoughts. That's right. Right. Yeah. You sign up. If you sign up with us, we send you a hard copy text directly to your house. We really think that reading difficult material requires when it's best requires I, a paper I, book. Yeah, I prefer it. There's something but also about, it's just nice having a collection. It, it, it is. Yeah, when you turn around at the end of the year and you see that stack, that knee-high stack of books that you went through, it's, it's pretty great. Uh, but we send you that to your home. Uh, we've got a, little, a, a chat community that's almost too busy for me to keep up with. People right. are in there talking about the text, talking to their groups. And then once a month, we have a two-hour online meeting where, where people, well, they, they have the similar experience. And we have one of our trained hosts lead those things. And they're just asking questions. They're asking questions. So, for example, if we were going to talk about the Iliad, yeah, let's say, let's say, well, what, let's kind of give people like a sample of like what an Adlerian, <laughs> right? Great books seminar. Like, what are like what are the questions? Like, I say, we read the Iliad. Yeah. So, if if we were going to kick off an Iliad session right now, and they're well, even if it's just me and you, and I'm the seminar leader for tonight, I might just open the thing up and say, "So, you've read the Iliad now. We read the whole thing. No, no, no spoilers. There's no Trojan horse in this one. No, there's yeah." I want, I want to start the discussion tonight by asking you, what is war? Yeah. And, you know, a, a, a good open-ended Socratic question like that will let us ultimately talk about everything in that book almost. So, you know, it's about the Trojan War, and I ask, what is war? Well, well, Brett, you've read the <laughs> what's war? What do you think war is? It's like, well, the ultimate competition. So... Would a sporting event then constitute war? It is a simulation of war. So, so we, we simulate it to make it safer. Then, so does war? Does that imply violence? Then, I mean, does it have to be violent to be a war? Um, yeah, I'd say it's some kind of sort of violence. It doesn't have to be physical violence necessarily. It could be oh, a trade war. It could be a trade war. So right, or it could be. I'm trying to think of another type of psychological. The war on drugs. The war on drugs, right? You're trying to you're trying to cause another party to submit or eliminate Ooh. them completely. So, so in the, in, the, in the instance of like a war on drugs, right? Like that's really not nominally a war. Is that a so? Is that a rhetorical thing that we're yeah, using? Yeah, I think it's a rhetorical because like the, we, drugs can't fight back. Right. right. There's no. There's oh, so there has to be an opponent. I'd, I would I would say there have an to be active an, opponent. an active opponent. So yeah, when you say like war, that's more of a you're. It's a metaphor. In in that case, for the right. war on drugs, it's a rhetorical thing. So so a real war implies violence and an active opponent. I would say so, yes. Yeah. Kind of where I'm at, maybe. But I could be wrong. Right. Well, I mean... No, and then no, like, you would have other people chime in. Yeah, and there's, there's eight other people in the room or 15 other people in the room. And then, there, you know, there, there are groups of people in these seminars that just scratch their chin and listen carefully. And that's you can, fine. You, that, that's great. Because the next time they may jump in and somebody else will lay out. And, and, and there are people that bring complaints about the books. Like, oh, man, I don't get it. What the heck? You know, they bring a complaint. There are other people that bring... Which is legit. Because not all of these books, I mean, they're not... Some of them are really... They rub you the wrong way. They rub you the wrong way, or you just don't you don't you don't jive with it. You're just, right. you're, and there's that. That's the other kind of thing that comes. You're like, you know, I read this. I don't get it. Right. Uh, but there's value, but I think there's value in that. There is value in that, right? Because uh, you can, like I said, you can bring all these other consciousnesses to bear on that that thing that you don't get, and maybe they can help you in turn get it. Right. But what happens more often is the guy says, "I don't get it," and somebody who thinks they got it says, "Oh, well, this is the answer." And then they get disabused of that, which is also <laughs> pretty interesting. But back to the war thing. Uh, you know, we talk about the Iliad. You end up talking about just war. Like, okay, is it, is, it, is war, it a just right? war? It was right. it for cause, a uh, role of man in the state. Like, there are guys right. that rode boats that had no skin in this game. I mean, ultimately, right. I mean, I, I, unless they were, except until they were conscripted. You know, there's so much you can talk about that. And it's maybe a work of fiction. It's fictionalized. Fictional, like, we don't yeah. even know what the we don't thing know. is. Right. I mean, yeah, with Iliad, you could talk about honor. What is honor? Honor. Is, honor, is honor a good thing? Oh, well, we did the Aeneid. That was one of my favorites that yeah. you and we did here at your place. You know, we got to be spent, I don't know how long, discussing what is duty and is duty good. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a big problem, actually. And, yeah. Is duty, is duty good? And so, so back to Adler. If we have a large, large number of people in our society that develop a complete concept of what duty is, I'm not even dictating what that is. I think that that has good consequences for living amongst each other. 
Like, you know, uh, that's going to change your notions about paying taxes, voting, voting, war, everything. Right. Or even family. I mean, family. In, the, in the Aeneid, like for, I think uh, we kind of talked about this for them, for Aeneas, duty was more about filial, like, you know, piety to your family. Mm. And like, you know, that's, that's a problem that everyone faces. Like, well, you know, my, my family really is bringing me down. Right. <laughs> Right, they're kind of toxic. Right, I need to get away. for for me. I got to get away from it to be better. Like for my, but like there's that. Like, but do I have a duty? Like, do I have a duty as a son to still take care of mom and dad, even though they treated me like garbage? Or they put cigarettes out on me. Right, right. now mom's sick. Yeah, yeah. And that this is where that's this is like I have, I have a friend who he said these are like the Tuesday afternoon questions. Right, it's like the questions that are relevant, not on the big picture, but like on Tuesday afternoon. How does this affect your life? And I think that's a, a great example of of that. Yeah, duty. Back to the Iliad. I think it's book six. I think Hector, who's the 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 Trojan hero, right, goes back to his chambers and his wife's there and he's got a baby and she says, "Hey, we've been in the walls for ten years and we're, if, if it's been okay, you don't have to go back out there. Don't go out there." And he's like, "I have to." And he goes back out on the field of battle and doesn't make it. Yeah. And it's just this heart-wrenching scene about his duty to the state, his duty to his wife and his child, honor. Like he has to go back out because of his honor. It's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. So I mean, you st- we, we you guys are right now really ancient. Yeah, you know, I think those when people think the great books, they often think Plato, Iliad. Yeah. Or, but how far? Like, you said Wittgenstein is like the latest edition. Yeah. But I mean, does, besides philosophy, are, is there like fictional literature in there? I mean, are you can yeah, read sure. Dickens and things like that. Or? Yeah, there's there's Dickens in there, Swift, Shakespeare, Shakespeare. I know, yeah, Shakespeare. Twain. Yeah, Mark Twain's in there. They've added. I'm curious. Are there any religious texts? Do they have like the Bible, the 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 Quran, the Gita? Well, it's of the West. Okay, so, so it's Western. So it's Western. So, yeah. uh, so if you go look at you know great books of the Western world or the Saint John's Deal, whatever, you're, you're going to find the the uh, the Christian Bible in there. We we don't read it, not because I'm against it. I just don't know how to do it online right. and and do a good job. You know, if you, it's just so charged. It is really charged. So if you have a seminar and you're talking about the Bible, and some person says this is the inerrant word of God, and the other guy says Bible as myth, right? We're just off the rails. Or if you got Calvinists and <laughs> right. <laughs> Catholics, and then you know, yeah, it, I, it's, I, I don't know how to do a good job of that. And, I think it takes a certain kind of yeah, person, you know, mm. to be in there to like be intellectually, you know, have your your beliefs, but still be intellectually curious. It definitely takes a certain type, and it's hard. I mean, I I, I admit it's hard. To and do. the good news is, is the Bible is probably the most discussed book out there. Like, if you want to get in a discussion group uh, covering that, they're down at your church or whatever, you know, right. three days a week. That one's not too hard to cover. So we've opted to to stay away from that. Although I think it's you know it is foundational. It's important. The canon references it all the time. I mean, you're reading St. Augustine. We're reading St. Augustine. And yeah, Bible's going to be in there, references. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things that people ask me. They're like, well, how do you read St. Augustine? How are you reading Aquinas without the, you know, out reading the Bible? Well, first of all, so many of us have read it. I mean, that, that's... But Augustine, Aquinas, all these, uh, Luther, they, ref- they, they cite heavily and the material that you need from the Bible is cited in their text. They, they let you know what you need there. Yeah. And, uh, and so, so we have opted to not, not cover it. Yeah. Although I think people should do it. No. Yeah. I think I just don't want to be, I don't want to be responsible for be that one. <laughs> yeah. I think everyone should at least read the Bible once all the way through. Cause it's, it's a lot of fun. The old Testament mm-hmm. is, it's crazy. It's interesting. You know, I, I said that for the Iliad, you know, our sort of kickoff question might be what is war and a good kickoff question can often be, uh, so you've read this book. What is the author's project? Yeah, what's he trying to do? What's he trying to do? Yeah. It, another good question can be, what is this book? Like, what is it? Like the Iliad, what is that? Is it a, is it historical fiction? Is it a piece of, is it a drama? What is, is it? it is, is it propaganda? Is it, or is there yeah. maybe a, uh, a critique? I mean, because what's interesting about the Iliad, it was you know written by Homer. Who is Homer? Who is Homer? That's another question. Like, who is Homer? I, I think it's mean, a great one, especially when you get to the Odyssey. I, they're, to me, it's clear they're not written by the same person. Right. They don't, they don't an, read alike yeah, at yeah. all. But, like, you know, Homer, whoever he was, or 
multiple. There could be multiple mm-hmm. people making that. That's another theory out there. That's that's fun to explore. He was Greek, and but when he writes the Iliad, he sort of paints the Trojans as like I don't know the vic- like the the good guys in a way. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting. Okay, why why would why would Homer a Greek? do that with the Trojans. That's, that's a question. It's like, what's going on there? Yeah. And those are the kind of things that we discuss. And, you know, in your home groups, those are the kind of things that you can discuss and, uh, you know, approaches that you can take towards these books. So if you say, so if we were going to do a session on the, on the Old Testament, let's say, which is a big chunk to cover in a, in a two-hour right, seminar, right. and you're like, hey, what's the project here? Right. What's the author trying to accomplish? Uh, what is this? What is this? Yeah. When we're at our best, we can we can approach those questions and dig into it and really benefit. And when we're not at our best, we <laughs> flip the table yeah. over and storm <laughs> right. out. You know, right? Well, yeah. I, I, we, this, we had a fun discussion with this on the Aeneid when we were discussing like, okay, what's the point of the Aeneid? Why why was Virgil writing this? What was the point? And like, because the Aeneid, if, if, for those who don't know, it's basically they they took the Odyssey. It's fan fiction. It's fan fiction, the Odyssey, but made it Roman. Yeah. So like, okay, what is and uh, what's and, and it's about the founding of Rome, Aeneas. Goes on this adventure. For, he's, he's at the Trojan War. He comes home, goes on this crazy adventure, and he found, ends up finding, founding Rome. So it's fan fiction, but it's like, but why did he do that? What was his goal in, in doing that? We had, we had a pretty long discussion about, you know, is this basically, is he creating a founding myth to give the Roman people a sense of who they are? Yeah. And, and, and today, that's my reading of it that, you know, he was. He wrote that to acculturize these these Romans and to hold them together, you know. And, and we 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 have that. We don't have one text, but we've got stories about George Washington, George Washington cho- chopping, chopping down the tree, cherry right. tree, Ben and Franklin got, with his kite. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So we're we're honest. So we're, as Americans, we're honest. We're curious, right? We got Paul Revere, right. you know, in his ride, and so we're you know we're 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 you know, we're, we're brave people. And so we, we have this, it's not only one story, but we have this founding myth and, uh, in that pre-literate, I don't know if it's not pre-literate, but you know, you know, Roman society at that time, it was probably harder to, to, uh, to put that founding myth forward. So he did that. Right. And then, so you have the discussion, is that useful? Is that good? Is it good to tell people that are sort of tell, tell a people stories that aren't necessarily factual mm-hmm. But are hitting on some important truths that you're. So I love that you know distinction. That's, Indiana Jones, right? You know, archaeologists look for facts. You know, we're looking for truth. There's a difference between facts mm. and truth. And that, that's great. Well, what is the difference between right facts and truth? I mean, that that's that's what I love about the 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 the, the, the seminar because you start somewhere and you think you're going to go somewhere yeah. else, and then you're like, well, what about this? And it's it's just so much fun to see where it you go. It is fun. It is fun. And you get to tear yourself down and uh, maybe maybe build yourself back up, and it's it's really interesting. Yeah. So Plato he talks about you know is it okay to lie to get people to do the right thing? Right. This is the Republic. The, yeah, the, facts. the noble lie. Yeah. Is that okay? Right. So yeah. For, for those who are like, I think the Republic is, you know, it's his Republic is a utopian government, right? It's his ideal. I mean, people think if you actually read the Republic, you're like this sounds terrible. <laughs> right. Right. Because right? like you're born. And uh, you're automatically sorted into one of gold, three gold, bronze, and silver people, right? And then you, the, whether you have ki- children or not is completely determined by right. they take. And if you do have kids, they take them away from you and raise them in a commune, right? Crazy, right? So, so here is is the is the republic satire? Yeah, that's that's another good question. And there's some people you know who say Plato was often very satirical, in his, but other people say no, he's dead serious. He wanted to do it, but. Yeah, for, for that republic to start, like he had to convince people. Basically, he said, we have to tell people that they are either gold, silver, or bronze. Like that's the noble lie. Like this is this is the creation story that we have to make up for people to get on board with this. And then, but again, going back to how all these great books are iterative. Republic, you know, you have, what was it, Thomas More talking about u- utopia, you know, and like, I mean, like utopianism, like started with Plato, this idea there's like you can create a perfect society. You know, you see that with uh, Moore later on. You see it with Marx that influences it's the Soviet Union, what's going on there. And then you end up with the dystopia and you end up with uh, yeah. 1984 and 1984. Uh, New World. And those things wouldn't exist. It's hard to understand that completely, what's going on there, if you don't read The Republic. Yeah. 
today, as Americans especially, we take it for granted or we think it's a given that you can design the government system that you live under. And Plato is kind of the first person that says that, that that's maybe that's possible. Maybe it is possible to sit down with a pencil and paper and figure out the best way to govern people. Up until then, it had been pretty much government had been emergent, had been kind of feudal or, you know, whatever, you know, tribal and emergent. And he said, no, you know, maybe we can, whether it's satire or not, he introduces the idea that we can thoughtfully come up with a way to govern ourselves. And then he passes the baton to Aristotle and he writes the politics and he puts forth how he thinks maybe it should be done. And, and off you go. And, uh, so interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm curious. So let's say someone wants to take up this baton and they do it themselves. And like, I'm going to start reading the great books. Like, is there, uh, do you have any suggestions based on your experience and in, in maybe reading Adler? Because Adler wrote a book called How to Read a Book. I think you start with How to Read a Book. How to Read a Book. Is, I mean, so he has it kind of broadly, like how does, how does he recommend people read these texts to get the most out of it? Yeah, he, he talks about there are kind of four levels of reading. You, you know, you kind of make an inspectional reading, you pass over the thing, you look at the table of contents, the headings, maybe look through the index a little bit, kind of get an idea of what the thing's about. And then you do a little closer reading. And then, you know, eventually, once you've read enough and you're good enough, you can do what he calls syntopical reading, S-Y-N-T-O-P-I-C-A-L, where you, when you read these books, you're actually reading them in context with all the other things you've read. And you, as you read, you can kind of juxtapose them with the other ideas that you hold or other ideas you've read. You can do that on the fly. And you know that's like the highest level of reading. But he talks about how to do that he t- in that book. He talks about how to make notes. And I think it's really important. I was a... I was a school kid in the 70s and 80s, and they taught me to skim and scan, you know? They taught me to speed read. And that's not how you do it when it's when the stakes are high. That's the way you read the newspaper, but that's not the way you read, you know, difficult, important material. And so a lot of us have that sort of a training, and Adler gives you permission to go slow, to not understand, tells you it's okay to struggle. And, you know, so if you start with how to read a book – that will set you up for, I think, more success in reading these these uh, important books. So you can't speed read through this stuff. Can't speed read through right. Through so it. like you have to make time to read. So like, how many like how 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 much time do you, does someone have to devote a day to reading? Does it take an hour? Is it just thirty minutes? I mean, is it? Well, we'll take what we can get, right? Uh, you know, you know, don't strive for perfection. You know, do what you can. But you know, the online great books dot com. And in my home group, we try to make we try to pick chunks, reading chunks that we can get done in three one hour sessions a week. We think that that's not too much to ask from busy people. I, I do think if you've only got fifteen minutes, you know, it takes a little while to get in the groove, you know, and then you have to kind of sometimes I have to reread that first page or two that I picked up in the session, you know, the reading session. You know, fifteen minutes isn't really enough, and hours a pretty good a pretty good chunk. So three one hour chunks a day. You know, you're going to read 3,000 pages a year. Yeah. You know, an average person. Sometimes, sometimes the the difficult, the material is really, really difficult. And we end up reading maybe six, eight pages an hour. You know, like Plato's or Protagoras. Right. Some of the stuff's tough. And the other times it, it's light and it's airy and it's fun and you just fly through it and you read all of Prometheus Bound in an hour. Yeah. The tragedies you can read. Yeah. And they're fun to read. I say it's fun. I mean, it's dreary stuff, but right. the, the doing is fun. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, for me, I, one th- one tip I have for people, based on just my personal experience, yeah, whenever you read something you don't understand it, don't stop. That's right. Just keep reading. If you don't, like, make a mark so you know I'm going to go back here and hit this part a little bit harder, but don't just keep reading. Because if, yep. you, if you let yourself get bogged down, you're never going to make any progress. Aquinas is doing this to me on every single page. I read a paragraph. I'm like, I don't get it. And then he explains it. <laughs> right. Two right. paragraphs later, he, he ties all the loose ends up. And I'm like, oh, I get it. Also, I think I'm a pretty good reader. I've got some reps in. I've got some experience. And some of these books, I'm really lucky if I squeeze 8 or 10% out of them. I mean, and that's okay. That's okay. I tell people all the time, like the Iliad, all of these books, one of the reasons they're great books is because they will meet you where you are. If you're a 14-year-old kid and you want to read the Aeneid, it's a great action adventure story. And you don't have to deal with issues of duty and founding myths. You, it's a great action adventure story. Just enjoy it for that. Enjoy it. And then, you know, and then when you're a, uh, an older person and you read that, it can be about legacy. 
right? It can be about your grandkids. It can be about, you know, posterity. And so these books, all of them will meet you where you are. That's, that's why sometimes you have to reread them. Oh, you got At different to. times in your life. Like the Odyssey is that for me. Like when I first read the Odyssey, it was just a fun read. Because it's a crazy, it's an adventure story. The first adventure story. Yeah. But then I, I, I had Daniel Mendelson on my podcast. He's a classics professor. He wrote a book. There's a memoir about um, his dad taking his Odyssey seminar. Mm-hmm. And, and that was a crazy, because like, then it opened up an idea that, no, this is a, a story uh, about fathers and sons. What war did that family? It's about marriage, you know, Penelope oh, and Odysseus. That's my favorite part. That's the best part. So Odysseus is gone for 20 years and he comes home and his wife doesn't recognize him. And he says, oh, I know about your bed. Right. Because his they, beautiful symbolism. He found this giant tree. He made, he, and he cut, you know, he cut this thing up and he made their bed out of the trunk of this tree. And it was on the second floor. So their bed, and they built. He built their home around this bed that was rooted in the ground, and it was secret. Only she, only she knew that only he knew about her bed. Right. And I just cried like a baby. Like, right. It's marriage. Because with marriage, it's it, marriage is is it's those, it, those it's those secrets that only you and your wife know. Yeah. And there, yeah. In in, in the conversations that you have, the, se- in, the inside in, in, jokes, yeah, the all pet of it. names. Ugh. So good. Like that's how you, that's how you develop a strong relation. I, I, I'm so, so you with this. You this project has just started. As you, with a lot of your groups, you're just with Plato. Personally, you're with you're on Aquinas. Are there books that you're like really looking forward to getting into? Are are f- the people that signed up in January are now are now digging into Plato, and I'm super excited for those people. Nobody reads Plato and says, "Boy, that was a waste of time." You know, yeah. I'm super excited for those people. I'm always excited for the next book, man. I, I really am. I, I, you know, we've got uh, we've got some Dante coming up in our home group. Oh, you know, Dante will around be great. Thanksgiving time, we'll yeah. hit Dante. I'm excited about that. I'm always excited about the next one. I really am. Well, no, let me take that back. I was not excited about City of God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember when you sent the email ads. Like, guys, this is not going to be fun. Uh, it's a giant brick of a book, uh, but it's worth doing. It's worth doing. So here's here's the thing about that thing. The thing about that thing. It's 1,200 pages, depending on what edition you get. But it was so important that people hand copied that at night by candlelight on dead sheep skins, <laughs> right? So that we could get it. It was so important to them that they copied that by hand for centuries. Well, let's talk about like what are the big ideas that it hits that we're still grappling with today. Uh, uh, in the city of God, yeah, city of God. Oh, the nature of God, nature, the nature of man and society. What is what is. Uh, you know what's right and what's wrong. What about where, where do ethics come from? Uh, what is the role of morality in the state? I mean, it just, yeah, he was a Neoplatonist, right? Correct, or is that ah, sort of neo Neoplatonist? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he's very influenced by the the Platonists. He he was a Manichaean. Manichaean, what is for for a minute? Kind of a I don't know a great deal about him, but he he was not Christian, right? And um, and then underwent this conversion experience, and uh, and then. Uh, his mom, his mother was a Christian, Monica, I think right. her name, and uh, he went and she prayed and prayed and prayed that he would have a conversion. He was, living, he was kind of a riotous. He was having a riotous. He was like a you know. Yeah, he had, he had a he had a, a concubine and a yeah. kid by this concubine, and then he ended up he ended up having this conversion experience and uh, and ended up being the bishop of Hippo, and then he wrote confessions. Actually, I may have that or, out of order, but he wrote his confessions where he pretty much. He's like a he's like a twelve step person. He takes his personal inventory, all of his character defects and flaws, everything he's done wrong, and, and he writes it up. And you know, it's a, it's a it's the first autobiography that we read. Yeah, autobiographical work. And he tells the story of the pear tree. Like he's like the worst thing I've ever done was I stole this pear not because I wanted to eat it, not because it tasted good, but just to steal it. <laughs> Right. The stakes were low, and I right. did it because it was naughty. He's like, this is the worst thing I've ever done. That's really... Yeah, so you could talk about that for hours. Right. Now, he's got some great stuff in the confessions about uh, unordered loves or disordered mm. loves, right? Like the the turmoil in your life is often caused by not loving, quote-unquote, loving the right things or putting them in the right you know, priorities. That gives you, like, whether you're a Christian or not, it gives you something to think about. It's like, how am I prioritizing my life that will allow me to 
flourish. Not not necessarily be happy, but but flourish, live a good life. Right. Yeah. It, it, so Adler says, and I believe, and so many of us believe that reading these books sets us up to have the good life. Right. That's the whole point of it. That's, that's the whole point. That's the whole point of this conversation. That's the whole point of philosophy. It, but it, it's a it's about that. I mean, reading these things is about that. And so we read about Penelope in that marriage, and we realize how much it meant to to, uh, to Odysseus. And we read about justice and virtue in Plato, and then then we read about stealing those pears and the uh, ultimate misery it caused him. The guy problem, the guy he stole them from, probably never knew it had disappeared. Right. But he talks about you know what it did to him. Aristotle before him talks about continence and incontinence, right? He talks about you know knowing what's right but not doing it anyway, like and no one and knowing what's wrong and knowing that it's wrong and doing the wrong thing anyway, and so you know we get to start to put our personal decisions into a more orderly context, right? And uh, it it does make for a better life. Also makes you miserable too. Yeah, you're like part of a you know it feels like you're part of a secret club, like you've got the, the <laughs> owner's manual. Yeah, right? and you're like, why is nobody else reading this? Why do they not know these things? Yeah, and what's great too is you get to you know we've been discussing a lot of philosophy, but you get to the literature, and the literature can be really just I think just as impactful and thought provoking, you know, compared to the the philosophy because it it takes those ideas that you've you know been like it takes the grammar. Mm-hmm. Right, we we'll call like you know Plato and and Aquinas like the grammar, the ideas, and then puts them in like a story, which allows you to play with those ideas in a different way. I think uh, whenever you put something into a narrative, it helps you remember it right. better. So that gets fun. Like you get you get to talk about or think about that as well. Yeah, you get to think about it and not actually have to do all of it. Right, right. <laughs> you know, that's uh, right. Well, isn't, that, isn't that the mark of, you know, the wise person is they don't, they don't have to make all the mistakes themselves, you know. And it, it, it's wonderful. Our, the, the people who are reading this with us are, I, seem to be having a wonderful time. I get, I get very, very kind emails that get me all choked up about these people that are reading these books. The guys are taking break. They're working the auto body shop and they, on their smoke break, they're, they're reading, uh, you know, they're reading Sophocles. That's awesome. You know? It is. That's, and that's how it should be. Like that's, yep. that's how it should be. My dream is that, you know, we've just got, you know, electricians, apprentices, and, you know, just regular folks all over the country that are working all day, applying their trade, and they come home and they don't watch Netflix. They're cracking one of these books, you know, and then they do it for years. The next thing you know, they're 40, they're 50, they're 60. And they're the kind of people that we're, that we all want to be, you know, we, we all want to be the kind of person that knows this stuff that's been through it. Yeah. And I, th- I think we can do it. The thing is, the t- you ask, how long does it take to read these books? What's the time commitment? Does it even matter? Like five right. years from now, you're going to be five years older. If you've spent the time on this over those five years, you will have been through that material. You'll know it, and you'll be changed by it. Right. And if you binge watch, uh, you know, whatever show it is, five years from now, will you be changed by that? I was changed by Cobra Kai. Cobra, <laughs> right? That was pretty good. No, but you're right. And I, I going back, to, you know, the connection with weight training, which you're, you're yeah. also a, a starting strength coach. That's the same thing. Like it's never too late. Right. Right. You might not get through all of it. Right. You might die. Right. <laughs> Before, but like, and you, you might not, you might never, might never reach, you know, a six hundred pound deadlift. But you're better for just getting started. That's right, and doing you, it now. You start where you are, and you do better. That's right. that's all we do. That's all you can do. So we've got guy, we've got. Uh, I have a sixteen year old, and I have a gentleman in his eighties, and then everybody in between. And uh, you're talking about Mendelssohn's discussion about the the Odyssey. Carl Schutt, who leads some of our seminars, he's a philosophy PhD, and he's been a big help to me in, in, in getting this started. His dad's taking this too. That's awesome. Yeah, he's awesome. I'm going to tear up again. I know. No, that's a great experience to have. Yeah. Well, Scott, this has been a good conversation. Where can people go to learn more about what you're doing? Oh, go to onlinegreatbooks.com and you can go sign up there. If you give the coupon code AOM, you get uh, 25% off your first three months. There you go. And it helps Brett, uh, support Brett's show too. And we will send you a couple books right off the bat. You can send you the How to Read a Book and The Iliad. And the next book you go into is The Odyssey. And then after that, we read Prometheus Bound and The Oristia. This is the book about Agamemnon's family. No, it's, essentially. it's great stuff. It's crazy. No, it's really good. I'm curious if there's if someone's listening to this right now, they like want to get started. They want to get a taste of 
what it's like reading the great books. Is there like one that you recommend that this is a good one to cut your teeth on? It's not it's not super intimidating. It's not going to take for like right. You just do it in a week or two. Yeah. Uh, well, I love the Iliad. I don't know if that's a week or two. Uh, I love the Iliad, but if you just want to see what the heck all of this is about, Prometheus Bound's wonderful. It's a very short little uh, Greek tragedy. Plato's dialogue, the Mino, I think is a wonderful place to start because it's about learning. It's about education. It's about virtue. You can go get it. You can go to archive.org and get the Benjamin Jowett translation for free there. It's pretty good. It's not the best one, but it's a pretty good translation. And I don't know, 39 pages, something like that, you know, and you can get the beats. You can get the feel of what Plato's like, what Greek philosophy was like, and well, get your feet wet. That's yeah. awesome. That's great. Well, Scott, thank you so much for your time. It's been yes. a pleasure. It's wonderful. Thanks, man. My guest today was Scott Hambrick. He's the founder of Online Great Books. You can find out more information about his program, onlinegreatbooks.com. As Scott himself even said, you don't need to sign up for his program to do the great books. There's plenty of lists online. We've linked to them in our show notes. If you got some people who want to discuss this stuff, start one in your living room today. But if you're having trouble finding people to discuss the great books with, it's definitely a great service to check out. If you do decide to use it, use code AOM at checkout for 25% off your first three months. Also, check out our show notes at aom.is slash onlinegreatbooks, where you'll find links to different great books lists that are out there, as well as links to resources that we discussed in this conversation.